Happy Sabbath on this very special Sabbath that is actually Christmas Eve. Yeah, day before Christmas. We are really glad that you are worshiping with us and we hope that this worship service fills you to overflowing. But before we get there with the rest of our program, we have a few announcements. First off, I uh, just want to let you know that the Candlelight Concert, this year's Candlelight Concert, is available video on demand. And then also starting at three o'clock today, we'll be showing some Candlelight Concerts from a couple of years ago. And then at five o'clock, we'll be doing the replay three times of this year's Candlelight Concert. So if you missed it or want to see it again, it was a great concert. We encourage you to check that out. It was really good. We hope that you will watch that. And this evening, we have a really special Christmas Eve program. It's Festival of Lessons and Carols, and it begins in our sanctuary at 4.30. So if you would like to come and join us, we invite you to. Again, that's 4.30 in the sanctuary this evening. Another quick reminder, we're going to do another read through the Bible. We really encourage you to participate in this. Church as a whole, we have a very specific program. There are many out there, but you can go to our website for more specific information on the program we're gonna follow as a church, but again, you're welcome to follow anyone. We just really encourage you to read through the Bible as a church. It's, it just changes things, it means so much. Really so, important. So go to our website, LOUC.org, and you can get more information on how you can participate in that. On January the 7th, we, which is actually, I think, our first Sabbath of the year, we're having a special communion Sabbath. Communion will be at all four services in Anthem and also in the main sanctuary. So please come out and join us for that special Sabbath. Well, that's our announcements for today. Yeah. So for the latest information, go to our website, LLUC.org. And we know that each of you finds yourself in a different situation this Christmas. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, we just pray that God's love surrounds you in a big and special way. We love you guys.
For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. John 3, verse 16 through 17. Jesus, today we come to celebrate that you came to this world and brought us your love and salvation. We come to celebrate that only you can give us eternal life. Jesus, thank you for loving us. We pray that your love transforms our lives and gives us the courage to share your love with everyone. Amen. Amen. That is the most precious thing you're going to see today. That was the Hartnell family. Why, why don't we give the Hartnells a hand? <laughs> Wasn't that well done? Camden and Preston, did your mommy dress you today? She did a good job. Jonathan, did Joanna dress you today? She did a good job. <laughs> We are so glad to see each and every one of you on this Christmas Eve. Now, I have a question for you. It's going to require some honesty and authenticity from you. So we're going to do this by show of hands. How many of you usually attend our services here at Loma Linda University Church? Okay, that's a, that's a muted few of you. How many of you usually attend our services via our media platforms and felt guilty today and felt, hey, we need to come to church? <laughs> yeah, there's a couple of you. We're seeing you. We're going to talk later. Now, how many of you are visiting from out of town? Can we give our hand to their, to their visitors? Yes, yes. One of you came to me and said, Pastor, you are so much shorter in real life than on TV. <laughs> and I felt bad. But then she said, you are so much better looking in real life than on TV. And then I said, Mom, stop. One final question. How many of you are coming as children with your parents, whether you're young, whether you're in college, whether you're coming home for the holidays? How many of you? We are so happy that you're back home. Welcome back. Last group. How many of you feel forced to come to church today? They're like, hey, we got to get our one time a year. It's Christmas. 
Okay, well, we don't have any of those here. We're happy for that. We're happy whether you are here you regularly, whether you are visiting, whether you're coming with friends and family for this wonderful reunion. Why don't we do something? It's Christmas, and so I think it's apropos that we turn to the person next to us, sitting right there in our pew, and we say, Merry Christmas. So Merry Christmas, choir. Isn't that beautiful? Merry Quis Christmas, string quartet, or octet, or sextet, or whatever you are. Merry Christmas, Kimo Smith. Kimo's really beloved. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Pastor Doug. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Pastor Adriana. <laughs> Merry Christmas, each and every one of us. <laughs> you know, friends, I've been thinking a lot about this particular season. And as we think about the trees and the tassels, as we start to consider the hymns and the wonderful music, as we begin to eat and enjoy friendship and fellowship together, the words continue to echo in my ear. The words written by Matthew, as Matthew was thinking about the real reason for this season, and you know the words, the words that he pens as he says, and behold, the virgin shall be with child. And she shall bear a son, and you shall call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So as we think about the reality of God with us, we also recognize that whether you're here in the sanctuary or you are one of the millions watching out there, in the midst of probably one of, the, one of the worst winter storms ever. By the way, here in California, to you on, on our media platforms, it's 72 degrees and sunny, so <laughs> just saying. Wherever you are, wherever you're coming from, and wherever you will be, may the reality of the Christ child be felt in your family and in your reunions. So friends, welcome to Loma Linda University Church, welcome to worship.
I invite you to remain standing this morning as we bow our heads for prayer. Loving Lord, this morning our hearts are full, just full of praise and gratitude and worship to you. Emmanuel, God with us. Lord, you sent Jesus as a babe over 2,000 years ago, innocent, fragile, weak. Came down from heaven, I gave up that so that we may have hope. Lord Jesus, you came to set the captives free. You were born, Lord, to bring hope and healing. And today, Father, not only we praise you and we worship you, but we especially pray for those who are missing here, Lord, friends or family, especially, Lord, those who are sick or suffering, we have friends in the hospital, Lord. We have friends in other places. Lord, we pray today that your healing touch will be with them, that the hope of that baby born in Bethlehem so long ago will be very present and tangible in their hearts today. Precious Lord, we have come to worship you, broken people, sinful, imperfect, but we have come to worship you. Because you love us the way we are and you take us where we are and you change us. Jesus, 
So we are here to worship you, and we say thank you. That you came that we may have hope. You came that we may be saved. So today, Emmanuel, be born in our hearts again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning and happy Christmas Eve Sabbath. We're so glad that you're here. For those of you who might be visiting us, we're on a building program, and we've been raising money through the giving season. That's November and December, and last Sabbath was our giving Sabbath. More about that in a minute. But I was making the holiday roast yesterday in preparation for tonight's meal. About 5 o'clock, my kids are home, I couldn't be more overjoyed. So we're going to sit down and have our family recipes. And one of those recipes is the special holiday roast that Dr. Herber, Dr. Raymond Herber, used to make for the family. And I used to sit there and marvel. Come on, Grandpa, make something straight from the freezer, whatever. Why do you go to so much trouble? He would get the steaklets and the two and a half onions and the two cups of cashews, put them in the Cuisinart, and you know that's awfully fun. You put them in the Cuisinart, and he made this amazing roast. It was very savory. Why do you do that? So much trouble. Year after year after year, I used to watch him do that and bring it in to the younger generations. Me and my kids and my cousins and nephews, nieces. And I... I think I get it. Yesterday I was in the kitchen remembering Dr. Herber and thinking this is what he used to do for us. And it was my turn. And I was making that roast and I was thinking I'm going to present this to the younger generations at great effort with a great deal of love for somebody else to enjoy. Friends, as you raise money for this building, it took great effort. It is with great amount of love. And you built it for another generation. We, may, we might not be able to enjoy it all of our lives. We might not live that long. But for the next hundred years, that building will represent Jesus Christ and weekly ministries through the life of this church. And I want to say thank you. One generation is called to work hard for the next generation in hopes that that generation works hard and blesses the one to follow. You have blessed the generations to follow because last Sabbath you raised $300,000 in a single day. Can I get an amen? amen? I want to say thank you so much. On behalf of the pastoral staff, it's not our church, it's yours. But, um, but it is incumbent upon us to organize and to bring givers together. And so $300,000 was applied to our goal of $1.2 million, and we're well over halfway there, and we have high hopes for the, the coming week. For those of you at home who have benefited from the media department, which is housed in the new building, we invite you to also remember us in your year in giving. We just can't say thank you enough. It's been a good year. The Lord has blessed us richly, and I want to look you right in the eyes and say, thank you so very much. Merry Christmas. We still are building for his kingdom. Happy birthday, Jesus. Christmas, all the tinsel and lights, and the presents are nice, but the real gift is you. Happy birthday, Jesus, I'm so glad it's Christmas, all the carols and bells make the holiday swell, and it's all Jesus, Jesus, I love you. 
Jesus. I'm so glad it's Christmas. All the tinsel and lights and the presents are nice, but the real gift is you. Happy birthday, Jesus. I'm so glad it's Christmas. Jesus, I love you.
Luke chapter 6, verses 11 and 12, 17 through 26. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were discussing together with one another because they were furious with Jesus, and they decided, wondering, what will they do with him? One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent all night praying to God. When morning came, Jesus went down with his disciples and stood in a level place. There was a large crowd of his disciples, and there was a great number of people from Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the coastal region of Tyre in Sidon. All wanting to hear Jesus and be healed of their diseases. And those troubled by impure spirits were cured. And all the people were trying to touch him. Because of his great power. And power was healing them all. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who mourn now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when everyone hates you, when they exclude you, when they reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for great is your reward in heaven. But woe. Woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will weep and mourn. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. The stars are brightly shining, it is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and ever pining, till He appeared and the soul felt its worth. Shall be 
We're continuing our Advent sermon series entitled The Gift. But before we return to the worship service, please read with me the following quotes. At Christmas, all roads lead to home. Blessed is the season which engages the whole world in a conspiracy of love. For it is good to be children sometimes, and never better than at Christmas, when its mighty founder was a child himself. Christmas is most truly Christmas when we celebrate it by giving the light of love to those who need it most. Once in our world, a stable had something in it that was bigger than our whole world. Let us upon the coming Christmas and New Year's not only make an offering to him of our means, but give ourselves to him in willing service. To each of us, from the oldest to the youngest, is granted the privilege of becoming workers together with God. Now let's rejoin the service. I invite the Vetter family to join me here on the platform this morning. What better time could there be than the Christmas season for the dedication of a little one to Jesus? Lily and Marcelo Vetter come bringing their little one, Liam Mateo, in dedication to Jesus today. Now, this family has traveled a ways to get here. It is true they first met at Relive back in the day about 10 years ago, so they're the genesis of their relationship was actually here in this church congregation, and of that we are deeply grateful. But that gentleman over there originated in Brazil, and this young woman here originated in Colombia, uh, the home of my birth in Latin America. 
but through a winding series of circumstances in which God had clearly his hand upon their lives, he brought them together here in this place. Now, it wasn't all easy from the beginning, was it? In fact, some differences in abilities to speak language, each of them, not one of them, each of them took it that the other one was stuck up. All right, well, you can be that way. But then something brought them together, and they begin to engage and talk, and, and I'll have to tell you, this is thin ice, but Brazil beat Colombia in the World Cup. <laughs> now, I'll have to tell you, Marcella, I, I, I'm with her on that one. <laughs> but do you know that two years to the day of that game, they said, I do to each other? And so love does indeed conquer all, does it not? That's amazing. But that's small compared to what happened with this little one here named Liam Mateo. Very complicated pregnancy, a great deal of uncertainty as to whether or not he would actually make his way into this world, and yet here he is today. Nothing less than the love of two parents and the power and the grace of God. Liam means strong warrior. Is that right? Strong-willed strong warrior. That's right. That's right, Marcel. Strong-willed warrior. And uh, Liam wants to make sure we get that part right, correct? Okay. And Mattel means a gift from God. And that is truly exactly what he is, a strong-willed warrior who is a gift from God. And this young family is just delighted to be able to dedicate him today. There are family members who are present and there are family members who are joining us by the broadcast. Quiero invitarles a todos que se pongan de pie en este momento para celebrar esta presentación. So if you're from a distance or if you're here, we welcome you. What a delight to have you here today on this very special Sabbath day. Even over here, I'm trying to see if there are others, and also by the broadcast. Now, Liam, through his dad, yes, very good. <clears throat> Actually, you may be seated. Liam, through his dad, wanted to communicate to me, I'm fine with my dad. So I'll respect that, Liam, because you're a strong-willed warrior, so I'll respect <laughs> that here today. But we do want to pray, dedicating him to Jesus, and we want to invite you to join in that prayer with us today. Let's pray together. Whoop, wait one minute. I want to read what you wrote. I almost forgot that. Mm -hmm. So let me read that to you. It's actually written as a prayer about Liam. Dear Lord, we come here today humbly asking for your blessing over Liam's life. May he grow to love you with all his heart and to follow your ways all the days of his life. We pray that his presence will be a blessing to others and his life a living testimony of your love. Help us to be loving, patient, compassionate, and understanding. Thank you for gifting Liam to us and for trusting us with his precious life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That's the parent's prayer. What a beautiful prayer. One day Liam will watch that and know what you prayed for him. But now let's pray together as we bless little Liam. Santo Padre, es un grato privilegio poder estar aquí presentando a este jovencito, a Jesús. Entendemos que tú estás presente aquí por tu Espíritu Santo, que el amor de Jesús lo cubre a Liam hoy y lo va a cubrir todos los días de su vida. Pedimos que tu santa presencia sea con los padres, con los abuelos, con toda la familia que se paró, y que siempre sepan que Cristo está a su lado. Todo esto te lo pedimos y te lo agradecemos, y pedimos tu bendición sobre Liam Mateo, en el nombre de Cristo Jesús. Amén. Amén. And all God's people said, Amén. God bless you both in rich ways. And you too, Liam. <laughs> Today's a very special day because we have a second family bringing a little one in dedication this morning, and that's the Milosavlovich family. So <clears throat> come right on up. <clears throat> Pardon me, Philip, Elena, Petra, John Philip, and little Mila, who is the focus today along with grandmas and grandpas, because grandpa's going to take part in this dedication since he's on our extended pastoral team. Now, you know this family, and you know them well. Uh, we love the Milosavlovich family, 
And we love the ministry that Philip and now his dad also is carrying out here in our midst, along with all the rest of the family. All right, John Philip, we won't bother you. <laughs> Philip, what a delight. Elena, what a joy for you all to be here today. So this is Petra down here. That's John Philip up there. And this is little Mila here. Mila, you are the focus today, and you are beautiful. We're so delighted to have you as a part of our church family. It's always a special moment when we dedicate someone, like we just dedicated little Liam Mateo. But in a real way, somebody on our own pastoral team, it touches our heart in an even deeper way. Philip and Elena, we have been privileged, Anita and I, to walk with you in a lot of different situations and circumstances in life. And we have grown. We have deepened because of our friendship with you. And we are so deeply thankful for that. It's been such a joy and a blessing. And to have this little Mila. Elena, may I try to hold her? Yes. Okay, so let me see if I can get this down right. I may not give her back to you, but we'll have to see about that. Oh, my goodness, Mila. <laughs> she is beautiful. <laughs> so what a joy. You know when we bring a little one in dedication, a key part of that is that we are bringing this child, asking God to bless her today and all the days of her life asking that she would be guided in the ways of the Lord and she would grow up to love and walk with and serve Jesus. That's all deeply biblical. But we're also dedicating you, dad and mom, grandmas and grandpas, and we're dedicating ourselves as a church congregation as well to be the kind of congregation where children can be safe and can grow up in the love and instruction of the Lord. So we bring her for those purposes. I'm supposed to read something, Philip, so I guess I'm going to have to hand her off here, and I think I'm going to hand her to Granddad over here who's going to give the dedication prayer. Yes. Grandpa, you sure you got her? Oh, I got her. You got her. Okay. So Whoops. now I'm going to talk. And give me to... one second. I'm going to read something that yes. Mom and Dad wrote. Um, Mila, as your parents, we want you to know more than anything else, you're the greatest gift we could have received this holiday. Our hope is founded for you in the name we pray over you. Mila, a name which points to being the sweetest one, being full of belo uh, beloved and full of grace. We want you to sense the fullness of God's grace as his beloved and ours. Rose is a family name which your mother and sister share, rooting you in a love of God's creation and beauty. Arabella points, paints the picture of an unyielding posture to God in prayer. Your source of strength and peace in the waves of life when we cannot be there, but God's presence is always. While Milo Savlovich is a difficult name to pronounce, it is a shared international history and an anchor to remember who you are, one who is incredibly cherished and loved. We dedicate you to Romans 15, 13. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank yes, you, sir. Pastor Randy. Yes, sir. I appreciate how many times I have to come here. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have come a bit. <laughs> She's our uh, ninth uh, grandchild yes. and a 17 in a member of our family. Wow. So we praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. I know I can pray just from my heart and mind, but I prepared something, honey, for you special. Yes. Yeah? Okay. Let's please uh, pray. Oh, Lord, thank you for this precious and beautiful life of Mila Rose, Philip's and Elena's daughter, third child, and our ninth grandchild. We know that she's a gift from you, Lord, and she's a really blessing to parents and to the family. Amen. We are praying that parents will raise her in a godly way mm -hmm. until she's old enough to make her best decision in life to accept you as a Savior and God. Amen. Pray for Philip and Elena. Give them, Lord, strength and wisdom to educate her right in your way. Mm -hmm. Lord, we are dedicating, dedicating a rose, Amila, to you today. We pray that you will watch over her and protect her. Please, 
let your Holy Spirit come and be her friend to help her to grow in you and in love, in your love, Lord. Lord, bless the child, this child, Mila, Rose, and let all that she does be fruitful. Amen. Please fill us with peace and love so Mila can grow in loving home. Thank you for your love and guidance through Jesus Christ, our Lord, whom we pray. Amen. 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 Yeah, yeah, you are a good listener. You are a good listener. Thank you so much. beautiful i saw an angel walking by and i was like i need to ask you a question okay, okay. if you had all the money in the world yeah. what would you do with it mm. i would pay off my loans i'd pay off my student loans and probably pay off everyone else's student loans i would then pay off my brother's loans <laughs> i would pay off all the debt and then use a lot of it for mission yeah i'll go with her answer <laughs> I would go to every amusement park in the world, probably. Uh, donate it to kids that are in the hospital. I would just save it. I would go to Target and buy some toys, but not spend it all. I will help the poor and also the animals. Uh, I'd like to start an orphanage. I would uh, fund some orphanages in Ukraine, and I would go on vacation. Perfect. I would use it to support God's work. I would probably give it away because I wouldn't know what to do with it if I had it all. <laughs> give it everything I could and pay off the church. Pay for the new building. I would give it all to Anthem. <laughs> wow, we love you. I'd buy a house in the woods and disappear. <laughs> I'd give it to Praxis. <laughs> I definitely give some to this church because that's the answer you're looking for. Bubbles. <laughs> and then you could run through them. Probably a fully decked out overlanded 4Runner TRD Pro. But, if I'm going to be real, a house so when I get married this May, I have a place to live in. Travel all over the world. Greece, Italy, Bora Bora, uh, Switzerland. I think it would be solve world hunger and then I would retire. Tim! Tim! Tim, come here! <laughs> like literally chasing people. <laughs> After worship one day in one of our services, somebody handed me a little note. I opened it and it said, I'm going to travel the world till my money runs out. I estimate I'll be home this evening by 10. <laughs> That's my story right there, and I'm sticking to it. Merry Christmas. Isn't this a wonderful day to worship God? Christmas, see, has the music just been... It has filled my heart and soul. Just so thankful for our congregation, every single one of you, and for those who lead us in worship. So we've been in a series entitled The Gift. We've been listening to the song of the angels. Over the four weeks of this series, this being the fourth, the echo of the angel's song has followed us. Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. All the way from over the hills of Bethlehem, the night Jesus was born, those words have echoed. Our question has been, upon exactly whom does God's favor rest? Upon the rich and powerful? Upon the mighty? Upon the beautiful? Upon whom does it rest? Well, in the Gospel of Luke, which is where we have remained, it rests upon some surprising people. We've discovered that God's favor rests on sinners who look like sinners and on sinners who look like saints because at the core we're all the same. God's favor rests upon the little, the least, the last, the lost, and the lonely. 
not upon the mighty of the world. And last week we discovered that God's favor rests upon those who know they need an invitation from Jesus if they're ever going to enter the banquet. They depend on that. And now today, we discover that God's favor rests upon those who know that God is their only resource. That God is their only resource. That's a tough one for us. That's a really tough one for us. Because by any measure, by any standard, we are wealthy. Compared to the rest of this planet that we call home, to people in the rest of the world, people in this world, we're wealthy. And so being able to come to the place where we say we know God is our only and ultimate resource is tough. Just consider it one measure, just one measure. I'm going to go out on a limb, although it's a pretty big limb. I don't think anybody's going to saw it off, and it's not going to break on me. And say that I suspect the number is very small if there's anyone who came to church today on public transportation. That's a really important measure in the rest of the world. Or what about this one? Unless it's because you happen to live close by, I suspect there may possibly be no one who had to walk to church today. We're wealthy. And so when we come to this lesson that says God's favor rests upon those who know God is their only and ultimate resource, it's a bit hard. It's hard for me. I suspect it may be challenging for you. But we need to read the words. They're found in Luke's Gospel, chapter 6. It's in this section that scholars often refer to as the Sermon on the Plain. Jesus is talking to his followers and to the crowd. The passage we're going to read has three sections. I just want to give you a heads up so you can watch it as we read it. Three sections. The first section is kind of setting the stage, giving the context. The second section is blessings, and the third section is woes. Now, the blessings and the woes have a parallelism to them. There are four couplets, the first one having to do with poor and rich, the second one having to do with hunger and being satisfied, the third one having to do with weeping and laughing, and the last one having to do with insults and compliments. But the one having to do with poor sets the stage, and it's a key theme in the Gospel of Luke. So with that as the background, let's read the passage. Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 17. He went down with them, that is Jesus, Jesus went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there and a great number of people from all over Judea and from Jerusalem and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. Wow. On Christmas Eve, no less. And yet those words introduce us to a key theme in the Gospel of Luke. And that theme is that when the kingdom of God arrives, there will be a reversal of fortunes. The present order of things will be turned upside down. Now, just knowing that that's a key theme in the Gospel of Luke makes us realize intuitively that the coming of the kingdom will be good news and bad news. 
It will be good news for some and bad news for others. And so the question is, how does that affect us? Is the kingdom's coming good news for me or is it bad news? Well, much of it has to do with this issue of power. How do we manage the power that we do have? And we all have power of some kind. Sometimes it's relational power or parental power or communal power or political power or financial power. That's the one that Luke zeroes in on here. The question is, when it comes to any place in your life where you have a sense of power, do you hold it, clutch it, cling to it, use it selfishly and abusively with others, or do you live an open-hearted and open-handed life, caring for, protecting, standing for others? If you live an open-handed life, then the coming of the kingdom is good news. If you live a selfish, abusive life, it's not good news. So the question that comes home to us then is very simple. In those places in my life where I have some influence, where I have some power, how do I treat the weak and wounded, the feeble and frail, the faulty and failing? How do I treat them? Do I live with my finances a tight-fisted or an open-handed life? Now, the news isn't particularly good, I'll have to tell you. It was a bit alarming to me to discover that it's not just what's in the pages of this book, but even current research is showing some interesting things in this area of our lives. A social psychologist, social scientist, researcher, just down the road from us, actually, down at UC Irvine by the name of Paul Piff, has been researching this area with his colleagues for a number of years now. He has a TEDx talk, has about 4 million views now, in which he describes how money affects us and our relationships with others. They've done quite a number of research studies, experiments, at the end of which he can summarize all of them with one sentence, disturbing sentence. Piff says, secular person, Piff says, money makes us mean. Money makes us mean. And I want to say, wait, wait, wait a minute. What, what, what are you talking about? Upon what do you base that? Piff says, glad you asked. So some of the research projects they've done, here's one of them. They, they went out and got 100 people and brought them in into their, into their offices where they were going to do the research. They divided them up into couplets, pairs of two. And each couplet was going to play Monopoly against each other. So they set them down across the table from each other at the Monopoly table, and, and they gave one of them twice as much money as they gave the other. They told the one who had twice as much money, when you roll the dice, you're going to be rolling two dice. You're just going to be rolling one. So this one got around the table a whole lot faster than the other one did. And every time you pass go, they said to the one, you're going to get twice as much money as this one gets. And then they stepped out of the room, though there were hidden cameras watching what was going on, and waited to see what would happen. And so they began playing Monopoly. It was not long at all before the one with the money was literally smacking the table with his or her game piece. One, two, three, four, five, around the table, asserting their power and control. When it came time to pay up, they said to the other, okay, you owe me $24. $24. You hardly have any money left. I, I'm going to own this whole board soon. And they started just lording it over the other one and just celebrating as they won. The researchers had put a little plate with pretzels on it on the table, and they both looked at it and said, well, well can we eat that? I guess so. By the time they were done, the rich one had eaten twice as many pretzels as the other one. When it was over and they talked to the subjects, the curious thing was the subjects appeared to, to assign the fact that they had won to their innate ability and skill and talent, not to the fact that the way the decision had been made as to who would be rich and who would be poor was by a flip of the coin. No one mentioned that. That's one of their studies. Another one, and this one is in Piff's own words. He says, we ran another study where we looked at whether people would be inclined to take 
candy from a jar of candy that we explicitly identified as being reserved for children. I'm not kidding, he said. I know it sounds like I'm making a joke. We explicitly told participants, this candy is for children participating in a developmental lab nearby. They're in studies. This is for them. And we just monitored how much candy participants took. Participants who felt rich took two times as much candy as those who felt poor. Wow. And then there was one study that really caught my attention. It had to do with crosswalks. You know, in the state of California, the law is if I'm a pedestrian and I come up to the street, the curb, and there's a crosswalk in front of me, it's the law that you as a driver have to stop and allow me to walk across. And so what Piff and his colleagues did is they divided cars up into five different categories depending on how expensive they were. Very cheap cars to the ultimate cars. That I, Yeah, anyway. So all of these cars were divided up. And then they watched over, I don't remember what it was, two or three days what happened. Every single car in the cheapest category stopped. In the most expensive category, half of them never stopped. Just remember after church out here. <laughs> Depending on what kind of car you see coming, you're taking your life in your hands. So, how does he summarize it? Here's how he summarizes it. What we've been finding is that as a person's level of wealth increases, their feelings of compassion and empathy go down. And their feelings of entitlement and self-interest increase. And I want to say, Jesus, did, did you know Paul Piff? <laughs> Have you all talked? No. Jesus says, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom. Woe to the rich. They've received their comfort. And I want to say, but Jesus, that seems awfully arbitrary. Do you really mean that? Maybe the best way we could think of it, it's not perfect, but maybe a helpful way to think of it would be to think of this. Suppose you are an emergency rescuer. You're not only on an emergency rescue team, you lead the team. And you discover you're called and told there's been a terrible catastrophe at a deep canyon nearby. A whole group of people have gone over the edge. Many of them, however, have survived. They're clinging to the canyon at all levels, although some have gone all the way to the very bottom of the canyon. You are called upon with your team to rescue the people. And so you come out knowing you want to rescue every single one. Now, the ones that are up closer, the ones that are not too far from the lip of the canyon, they have this sense that, look, I can get out of this myself. I'll climb out. I don't need a whole lot of help, maybe a hand. But the further you go down, you realize by the time you get to the bottom of the canyon, the people there are saying, we have no hope of rescue unless you help. That's the only way out we have. Now, what if, what if, furthermore, those who are on the higher levels of the canyon impede you helping those at the bottom? That's where you enter the world of Jesus who says, blessed are you poor, yours is the kingdom. Why? Because you have realized that your only source of help is God. It's the only one on which you can depend. Amen. Woe to the rich. You're not so clear on that. It's a lot harder to decide whether God is truly your only source of support and help. This cuts right across my grain. Right across who I am, having been taught to, to, to work hard, to, to achieve, to accomplish, to study, to apply yourself, you can do it. To be able to come to the place where I say, God, when it comes to my spiritual life, my spiritual realities, you are my only source of help, support. 
You're my only resource. That's a tough reality to accept. Maybe Clinton Arnold, New Testament scholar, puts it the best when he says this way, the physically poor are spiritually advantaged because their poverty fosters reliance on God. The physically rich are spiritually disadvantaged because their wealth presents a hindrance to putting God first. Could it be that it all has to do with how deeply I recognize that my only true source, my only true resource is God? Thus it is that God's favor rests on those who recognize that. Now, I have to tell you, in case you feel a little bit jarred, as I have this week in studying this passage, that Luke was not the only gospel writer to record the passage. Matthew also records the passage. Matthew, as he writes his gospel for a different audience, remembers certain pieces of it, That will apply to his context. And so when he writes this beatitude, Matthew writes, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Matthew, in saying that, maybe speaking to you, maybe speaking to me, because he's saying the truth is, friends, whether you are financially secure or financially challenged. The deepest issue is, is there a poverty of spirit that says my only true resource is God? And so we spent the summer in Guatemala. Three of us were friends. We were students We were there to help build the radio towers that would hold the antennas for the Adventist World Radio Station being built. It was interesting work, scary work, hard work. But the summer moved along. And it wasn't just the three of us. The engineer was there, certainly. But then there were two men from from the local area. It was the mountains outside of Guatemala City. These two men, Juan and Pedro, were delightful men. They were cooperative. They laughed at our jokes. We had a good time working together. They worked hard. They had nothing by way of this world's wealth. Pedro was missing some teeth and would likely never have them repaired. But as the summer went on and the towers went up and the days grew short, they came to us one day and said, we'd like to have you over to our place. Pedro said, my wife would like to host you. So we said, okay. So the next to last day that we were there, we followed Juan and Pedro down the trail off toward where Pedro lived. And we finally arrived at his, I don't know, lean-to, corrugated tin, cardboard, drapes where doors ought to have been. He said, okay, we're here. He ducked in, came out. My wife wants you to come in. So we ducked inside, very poor lighting. It took a moment to adjust, to be able to see the hard-packed dirt floor. And on the wall, some artwork kind of Jesus on velvet. And his wife said, here, please sit down. She pulled up three stools. Quick glance around the place, we realized there were no more stools. So we said, no, we're, we're, we're fine. We'll stand. No, 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 no. You have to sit. We're, we're, no, 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 por favor. And so uncomfortably, we sat And she brought out coffee to us. Coffee. I'm not a coffee drinker. I've never been much of a hot drinker until recent years. True to my southern roots, the more ice, the better. But anyway, 
She brought out coffee. And I held that coffee, multicolored tin cup. And we drank that coffee. And I realized that in certain circumstances, coffee tastes just like communion. Communion. They gave us all they had. I was thinking about that this week. And I got to thinking, I wish, I really wish that at that time I had been reading the Gospel of Luke. Because if I had been reading the Gospel of Luke, I think at a certain moment, I would have said, shh, to Pedro and to Juan and to their families, the three of us, I would have said, shh, listen. Because had we listened, I think we would have heard the angels sing. Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to Juan and to Pedro. And to these three gringos who are just beginning to understand how poor they are. Peace to you. And that's God's song for you today. If in your heart of hearts you know, my only true resource is God, then I can say, listen quietly, because heaven's song declares God's favor on you. Gracious God, Thank you for a kingdom where the rich are poor and the poor are rich and everybody can depend on you. Let us leave this place hearing the song of your favor with open hearts and open hands to all who need. In the name of Jesus, amen. Would you remain seated for the post loop?
Well, another week, and this is a very special week for lots of reasons, not the least of which, the season. Yes, and we have some disappointments, some challenges, but it's a wonderful time because we remember the birth of our Savior, our redeeming Lord, our returning Lord. May you find hope this week. First on my list today, Gary Lynn Zimmerman, right here, Loma Linda. Congratulations on your birthday, Gary, as I see you there with Dorothy and surrounded by members of your family. And yes, it's Dorothy's birthday as well. And glad to see you too with your canine family member. Warmest congratulations. Hello, Ed Bowes, Lincoln, Nebraska, 77th birthday. All the best to you, sir. And you're a pilot for sure. And even a dreaming younger pilot, I can tell. Anita Mackey, Silmar, California. Now listen, folks, this lady is 109 years old on January 1. There she is, wrapped up snugly. But she was invited to meet Queen Elizabeth when the Queen visited Santa Barbara a few years back. Now, Tividad, Lagos, Arnopia, right here, Loma Linda, 94th birthday, I read. And there you are as a young man surrounded by your family and then the members of your family in succeeding years. In fact, I learned about your birthday, sir, from your eldest daughter, Annabelle. Karina Bondar, Rye Beach, New Hampshire, 13th birthday. Happy 13th birthday, Karina. Glad to see you there with sister and with your parents, Dr. and Mrs. Vitali Bondar. Jeremy Hubbard, right here, Loma Linda. Happy birthday, man, 47th, I read. And so glad to see you with Alexis, and then Allison, and then the three of you. Char Griffith, Caldwell, Idaho. 82nd birthday, I read. So glad to be in touch with you and to see you with husband David, who is my classmate from Gem State Academy. Seth Gaona, 68th birthday, also right here at Loma Linda. All the best to you as I see you with members of your family. Mariana Contreras, San Bernardino, 22nd birthday. Congratulations, and so glad to see you and know about your birthday. And the same goes for you, Jim Ripley, Spring Branch, Texas, 84th birthday. Wow, congratulations. Glad to see you with Maggie at a Red Sox game, and then with your daughters and son-in-law, all of whom are over Massachusetts way. Artyom Kachaturians. Razan in Russia. Happy birthday, Artyom. So glad to know about your special day and to see you there with wife Olga. What wonderful memories we have. John Dibdahl, Dr. Dibdahl, College Place, Washington, 80th birthday. Glad to see you with Kathy and there also with John and Pam McVeigh. Congratulations, Dr. John. Hello, Barbara Wareham, now living at the villa. I am so glad to be reminded of your birthday and be able to wish you all the very, very best. Rachel and Randall Terwilliger, Sweetwater, Tennessee, 27th anniversary. There they were, and yes, there they are. Hello, Shelley Parks, Salem, Oregon. Bless your heart. I knew your husband before you did. Glad to see you with Gary. Congratulations on your birthday, Shelley. Ruth Christensen Henriksen, now Seattle, Washington. But she and I knew each other back Walla Walla College days, and we graduated the same year. But now it's your birthday, Ruthie, and I'm so glad to send this special greeting. Klaus Leukert, hello Klaus, happy birthday to you, sir, and glad to see you with dear Edreen. We love your family so much. And that goes for you, Ernie Castillo, now a visiting pastor at University Church, and glad to see you with dear Sarah, who is a leader in the prayer ministry. Brianna Draper, Ultawa, Tennessee. Happy 12th birthday, Brianna. 
there with your poodle. And yes, it's Phil and Joey Draper's grandparents they are. Their 45th anniversary. All the very best to you two. Raquel Ferreira Sherwood. Hello, Raquel. I appreciate your ministry so much. In fact, we all do. You can see Raquel's name listed in the credits every week at Loma Linda. And there she is with Philip, who is an important part of media as well. But the best part of their lives is precious Ariel Bray. Hello, Tom Dickinson, right at the villa. So glad to be reminded of your birthday. All the best. And that goes for you too, Howard Pinner at the villa on a himeno. Also a member of the villa family. Congratulations on your birthday. And that goes for you too, Shirley Mino at the villa. Happy birthday, lady. Hello, Willard Beeman. Glad to be reminded of your birthday and wish you all the best at the villa, as well as Margaret Yanagihara, also a villa family member. Happy birthday, all of you. Hello, Fred Cornforth. Boise, right nearby here. Happy birthday and glad to see you with Lady Jill. Carla Gober Park, Orlando, Florida now. So glad to be reminded of your birthday and see you there with Gordon. Cyril Hardy, Dr. Hardy is over Annapolis, Maryland way and this is his 98th birthday. Happy birthday, Cyril. And there you are doing your great grandpa thing. Hello, Ernie Steiner. Haven't seen you for too long, but happy birthday, brother, and wish you and dear Barbara all the best. Phil and Glenda Binkley, I saved you two till the last very important 59th anniversary for these two. There they were. Yes, and there they are. We love you all. And I find hope with my precious wife, Betsy, because this is our anniversary. And we have so much for which to thank the Lord. And we thank him for all of you as well.